Hello, everyone, and welcome to Gray's Matter Podcast, where we talk about things and stuff. Today, we have our co-hosts, Jen and Aaron. How are you two Hi. doing tonight? I am doing good. I do I not have a migraine this week. That is fantastic. I'm doing slightly less good, but... Yeah, it sounds like you've had yeah. quite the week so far. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's been a lot of minor annoying things. Even the minor things, they do build up quite a bit. Yeah, they all happen at once. It's like you have five or six minor things. It's never... It's like a tiny avalanche where you're like, none of these stones are particularly large, but it is still an avalanche. Exactly. I did have two migraines this week, and that was really frustrating. When I say I yeah, don't, I don't have a migraine like this week, I mean, like, at this exact moment, I am not in pain from a migraine. Oh, yeah. I'm not at this moment either. <laughs> yeah, I don't I don't actually get migraines. You get bad sinus headaches, and I had one. Oh, Jen, um, you're cutting out there. Is your headset plugged in? It is plugged in, yeah. Can you hear me? I can hear now you. Now it's okay. The last couple sentences was really in and out. Me right now? Can oh. you hear you right now? Much yeah. clearer. Much clearer. Much clearer. Okay, let me know if I start cutting out again. Sometimes my Wi-Fi starts to act up, and I have to switch which what internet I'm using. I totally get that. Been having that yes. problem so constantly just... here. You know, we have one of those routers and modems, so it's, we have two different Wi-Fi connections uh, uh -huh. with two different networks, and it's so frustrating. Didn't we just used to have where we had one and it worked, or did I just imagine that? I mean, that's how I remember it. That's, that's, so, that's basically how ours were. Yeah, mine, I've got like my PS4 right now. I've got it hooked up to a cable and I've got it. I, obviously, it does Wi-Fi because one of them will start to act up and I'll have to switch to the other one. And it's like, could you just like work? I'm paying 50 bucks a month. Like, come on. Yeah, this is this is not the timeline that I signed up for. You know, they no. had promised oh. us things like flying cars, though I'm glad we don't have flying cars. Yeah, no, seeing the way people drive, absolutely yeah. not. Yeah. And there'd be so so much bureaucracy around it. Like, you'd have to figure out how to have 3D roads. I would rather that, I don't know. There are actually three groups where I would be okay if they had flying vehicles. Emergency services, so like, you know, ambulances, yep. mass transit, and yep. freight. So, you know. Honestly, mm -hmm. that would that'd be very helpful for mass transit. If you made it so public transit got to use airspace and everyone else had to just drive on a road. Or even float on a road. Even float on a road. You know, yes. Get that uh, <laughs> back to the future tech, but make it six inches to a foot off the ground. We, we could do it with magnets. Yeah. I think that's mm -hmm. what we do in some other sci-fis. Like, that's what Cinder does, I'm fairly sure. Magnets. The cars in Star Trek Into Darkness. I mean, they don't specifically say it was magnets, but they look like they're floating. See, now you've invoked Into Darkness, and my brain has tried to erase that. <laughs> I haven't seen it. It's okay. I, yeah. I haven't seen it. It's not a my, good film, in my opinion. Yeah. Was that one my of the brain... New, I was just saying, is that one of the new ones, or one of the old ones? Yeah. It's one of the yeah, new ones. Yeah, one of the new ones. Yeah. Was, it the, was it the one that had um, Cumberbatch in it? Yep. Yes. Cumberbatch yes, as Khan. Yes. Yeah, that wasn't... There is nothing problematic about that. I don't know. What oh, no, not oh, yeah. even a little not bit. I don't all. know what no. anyone is saying. My brain is continuously trying to, like, cut out into darkness. So it's like I'll get confused about which one is Star Trek Beyond because it's like my brain is trying to make Beyond, like, the only Star Trek movie. <laughs> yeah. Well, Beyond. Out of the, the new ones. Beyond is the one yeah. good one out of the reboot franchise movies. Yeah, well, it's that's because the they got somebody who. Well. well, that's because they got somebody who actually liked Star Trek to write it. That does help. It does. I was a little surprised that uh, not Franklin, Justin Lin did so well directing it <laughs> because you know he is the uh, Fast and Furious director, but it was for the most part great direction as well. And yeah. uh, I'm just really sad that that's the movie that did the least well out of the three because mm -hmm. it had the most Star Trek feel to it. it. Like it ended with that message of hope, that feeling of hope. You know, it really let so, the individual characters have their moments more than mm -hmm. either of the previous two did, and yep. it just tanked. I yep. cannot remember if I saw it. If I did, I saw, I think for all three of them, I saw them like in theaters and then have not seen them since. So I remember basically nothing. 
Yeah, I saw all three of them in theaters. Um, I've rewatched Beyond um, a couple of times, and I've rewatched the first one, um, but not the middle one. The first one's not a great Star Trek movie, but it has some cool-looking effects and stuff in it. It's, it's a decent action film. Yeah, yeah, it's just not a good Star Trek film, but... The second one's just like, why this? Like, if you're gonna redo Wrath of Khan, then like, what? So that's, that's part of the other thing. It's like, it's a completely different story. Borrows very minimally, but it's like, why couldn't you have just done this with an original villain? Yeah. Especially Not... if you're gonna cast, like, a white dude. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, literally the only thing that ties it to the original is that the character is named the same thing, and then he's got a similar background with him that, like, you, you had to know that he was with however many people that they went and turned into bombs or whatever. You could have just made somebody up and then yep. not had people go, why did you cast Cumberbatch as Khan? Yep. In the uh, the new movies, because they changed the timeline, it's like there isn't that history anymore. Exactly with Kirk and Khan, you know, so it makes less yeah. sense. Well, that's why into Into Darkness, Kirk wasn't the person that Khan was lashing out at. Yeah. Somebody else entirely who's not a character. Like Kirk he being there was just kind of incidental. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And and happened to kind of be the best person. You know, in some ways, he kind of plays more as a Picard in that episode, because I feel like Picard, you're more likely to have the person who is really pissed off at some person in Starfleet, and Picard manages to sit down and be like, okay, how are we actually going to deal with this so that nobody has to die? Yeah, yeah, Picard had, um, or it seemed like he had, and it's been a while since I've seen all the series, so I might not be remembering it right, but it seemed like he tended to have less personal grudges against him. And more of what he did was for a Starfleet. Well, I think he had the same number of personal grudges against him as an well, had more, member, but I feel it like seemed he less, less because there was to. more seasons. Well, I think yeah, yeah, he had, I was just he had I more time. He also didn't push back necessarily quite as hard. Like, I feel like he had less grudges. I mean, mm -hmm. he had uh, Brock, or... Is that how you pronounce his name? The Frankie guy whose son was in command of the ship that the Stargazer destroyed. And then uh, um, Tomalak were his, you know, main two repeated foes. And, you know, Kirk had Khan and uh, Koloth. I mean, Khan wasn't really a grudge until they brought him back for the movie. That's true. Really for because Kirk, it would be the, Koloth yeah. and Kang. Because the way it ends off in the episode in the season... It's, it's not actually terrible, because technically it's a lot better than it could have gone. It was a lot nicer yeah. to Khan than... Because that was the other thing in Wrath of Khan. You're like, you're mad at this person because after you tried to mutiny and kill him and his entire crew, he left you on a planet and didn't magically foresee in the future the fact that there was going to be a disaster here. Yeah, but I think part of his point was just kind of like, you could have looked once in a while. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's not really your responsibility to look mm -hmm. at the person who attempted to kill you and steal your ship. Like, if you're if you're letting them go, if you're dropping them on a planet, and you're going specifically for one that's habitable, you're not responsible for him now. It's not like this is... Mm -hmm. The guard may have checked in, but I the can't... The guard really probably would have checked in. Yeah, oh, yeah. I can't really fault Kurt for not. And honestly, if he'd just put everyone under and then delivered them to a fucking starbase if you just put them unconscious and then drop them off at a starfleet base like it would probably not have gone very well for khan all things considered the uh the novelization for star trek the wrath of khan delves a little bit more into it so like uh they didn't put much detail into their reports so that people wouldn't go seeking them out that makes sense and that's why Chekhov on the Reliant didn't remember a, a, it. Plus, he wasn't a bridge officer, so he didn't deal with it firsthand. And oh, well, you go to a lot of planets, you're not going to remember them all. Yeah. Especially ones that you don't stick around for. Plus, City Alpha, or the proper name, because Alpha City is an actual star. So, in the novelization, it's called Alpha City as well. Because that's the real star name. And Alpha City 5 and 6 is a double world. And so the reason why when the Reliant gets there and is like, huh, 
there is a planet missing, but it doesn't seem like it, is because it's kind of like Pluto and Charon, where they share right. the orbit. It's like, well, it was an old probe that went out and looked at this place. It probably just, you know, recorded it wrong. So or it, something happened, because yeah. things happen in space. Yeah. The novelization makes a lot more sense than the movie did. I feel like that's part of the point of novelization. Typically, you yeah. Can, you can sit down and you can, like, dig in more than you can in, like, a theater flick. Yes, definitely. But yeah, Into Darkness tried to put in Space Seed, Wrath of Khan, and elements of the Undiscovered Country all into one movie. So not only was the writing not good, but the pacing was off because they tried to cram too much into too little time. So it's just, you know, go, go, go. No time for development. But we need development because you're redoing everything. Why? Mm -hmm. Which, in that case, just be original. Yeah. Just find some guy and you're like, oh, it's a character we've never seen. I don't think that's actually going to be a problem. I think throwing in somebody who literally the only, like, the name is the same and then part of the backstory. But the grudge, that's what the movie is based on, is the grudge. That's the inciting incident. That's completely different than why. And we all knew it was Khan. And they tried to lie to us. Lying isn't witty. Make up a different backstory. Yeah. You already made up a different backstory. Just move it slightly further away from the original. Uh, there's Dial this serial numbers. There's this YouTuber whom I follow. Uh, I think it's Triangulum Studios who did it. Discussed a way to make Into Darkness a better film. Where it's John Harrison, who is the bad guy of the film. And talks about why he is out to stop Admiral Marcus and betray Starfleet. And he goes out to search for Khan. And he comes up with this brilliant storyline. I'll, I'll post in the show notes a link to the video. But it's so much better than what J.J. and Orsi came up with. And it also doesn't lie to us about, this isn't Khan, this isn't Khan. Oh wait, no, it actually is Khan. Have I... I'm assuming, Justin, you have. Have you guys seen Picard? Yes. Several times. Very much have enjoyed Picard. So because it was actually, my husband was watching it, so I didn't start watching it until several episodes in. So I've seen the second half of the series, meaning I know basically everything that happened in the series. Because, you know, I'd be like, who is this person? And have it explained to me. But I actually should sit down and watch the earlier episodes. What did you think of the ending? I mean, I agree with Picard that there was no reason they had to take off. Um, they had to get him exactly in, as late in life as they got him. But, no, I liked it. How about you, Jen? Um, I'm trying to remember exactly how the ending went, because they did the thing with the thing. I mean, they had the whole thing with the, with the androids, right? The uh, VC Andrews sister fights Seven of Nine mm -hmm. and gets pushed off the edge. And All right, okay. Picard fights the Romulans until Starfleet arrives mm -hmm. and oh that's right the VC yeah. Andrews brother is not brought up again and the entire VC Andrews thing really creeped me out which was VC Andrews right, so um VC Andrews was a novelist a friend of mine introduced me to her novels I haven't read them though but incest is one of the themes in her novels and mm -hmm. the Romulan siblings who are part the, of yeah, the right. Shiar, Vat uh, no, not Vot. The, the, the Romulan agents, who are not no. Commodore O, seem the, the super sexualized, sister. and they're siblings, and it Yeah, yeah, there was a super off. big, like, yeah, there is a super big Game of Thrones uh, feel going on there. <laughs> yeah. But I felt that she was really playing into that, like, one of the early, you know, partially yeah. making fun of him for his relationship with, you know, the synth. But a lot, a lot of their interactions more felt like, especially like in one of the later episodes where he kind of goes after, he's like, yeah, so I'm the worthless little brother who got us here. Yeah. And it sounds like he's been living in her shadow for like his entire life. Mm -hmm. And he finally, unfortunately, in a way that is really terrible. Okay. Let me be honest. I liked that she died. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I can't argue with that. Yeah. He was a character who I could see, like, having some ability to, to say... She she was just awful. Yep. Yeah. Every single thing. She, and she knew it. She was very sadistic. 
mm-hmm. like the bit where she's with her grandmother who's unconscious in the thing oh her aunt she's like, yeah or yeah and the she, redhead and she's just like you know the boar should have or the, you know the boar should have tried to go for me i would have been an excellent boar yeah, I just kind of had to refresh my memory a little bit because I only saw it the one time and it's been a few months. But yeah. um, I mean, I liked it. Uh, the re- relationship with the Romulan siblings was a little bit weird and I didn't necessarily care for the fact that some of the sins actually turned out to be evil. So I'm like, oh, come on. <laughs> like, did we have to do this? I don't so... think evil is the right term. Like, one of them was conniving. Yeah, yeah. Ways. But in general like i feel like the entire point like where picard was coming from and where it kind of went to wasn't that they were evil or good it's that they were still very very naive but you had the one that kind of like killed one of her sisters and was like trying to work with those um you know that group that was going to destroy the universe and wipe out all the biological life the extra dimensional ai yeah Yeah. it was Yes, you had the one who was conniving and tricking other... The thing is, the reason that she did that was enough people were on the fence to something that she looked at as she's like, well, no, we we have credible proof that there is a threat. And not defending what she did, obviously. But it wasn't coming necessarily from a place of malice. Once again, I think this had to do with some of the naivety when, when they're talking about, yes, they were attempting to wipe out a large part of the universe theoretically we don't actually know what was coming through essentially which i found kind of mm-hmm. weird because it's like if these like old synth have just have have basically written off all organics in the universe i don't know why they like waited they're like oh yes organics are dangerous to us and they will always hate us and try and oppress us so when we see that happen and somebody tells us about it we will then go and wipe them out instead of doing it right now. But I think that, like, I get some of that, but she did still, like, stab one of her sisters in the eye to yeah. frame that other thing, and I have a little trouble with that, yeah. you know? Well, not only, does, she, not only yeah. does she do that, but then she lets the threat go. Like, yeah. that, that was part of it. So she kills her, mm-hmm. kills her sister, which was kind of interesting because he lied about that to his sister. Because when she finds when they she finds him, you know, she asks, you know, have you fucked any of them? And he was like, no. And she was like, have you killed any of them? And he was like, yeah, one. I guess you could say that he did by proxy. But I I found it interesting that when we saw, and I know this is because we had to like when we saw the like it had to be really damning evidence. But it was interesting that she was the one who had stabbed the eyeball instead of just like saying, hey, you have to go kill her now. But no, definitely not trying to paint her in any kind of positive light. But it was, in fairness, one of them who decided to set free a threat in order to try and... Like, honestly, there are ways she could have accomplished that that would have not involved murdering someone. Yeah, I just kind of didn't like that it, you know, because they spend the whole time trying to, um, you know, say, oh, no, the, you know, the censor not dangerous and stuff and then one of them turns out to be dangerous and it's like oh come on (laughs) i I feel like it when because the line that we get after that after and you have to forgive me i'm bad at names i don't remember the names of any of these characters but after the one human that was there finds out like when he looks at the footage a i assume yeah and he was like wow because he makes a comment where he's like I had hoped you guys would be better than us. And then puts her... Like, it's humanizing. Yeah. Like, I think they do a good job of not making it so, oh, these synths do have the ability to be as evil and malevolent as a group, and they more do, no, these are real people. Like, yes, we have one that is conniving and murders someone to frame somebody else for it so that she can try and murder all life in the universe. But most of them, once this is pointed out to them, once they get from Picard, they do shut it down. They do stop it. They don't... She didn't even... They didn't even make it so it was like a collective of them. Like it was one. It wasn't Mm -hmm. like there were like several of them plotting or something. If anything, 
the naivety and the kind of patronizing amount that like the card does of them is a little bit like insulting oh yeah but like the the patronizing that picard did i liked how they didn't hide that though because it yeah. also reinforced that the Federation historically has been very much Euro-liberal supremacy. It, it Even though they seem very enlightened, it's been very much, here's our ideals and you must conform to it because we're right and our right way is the way to be. At least if you want to be a part of our Federation. I do like the fact that, theoretically anyway... You have the prime directive, so they don't go to worlds where people seem to be doing fine and tell them, actually, you are living your life terribly. Live it as we tell you to. They did that in the original series, though. Granted, that was, you know, the 60s versus TNG being the 80s and 90s. Still manages to be depressingly progressive. But that original series episode, Arena, always bothers me. Because Spock is right and says, you know, these people... Arena is the one where Val, the giant stone snake head, is the people's god. And, you know, everyone there is happy and healthy. And they just bring him some food every day. And then they do what they want. And Kirk and crew beam down. And then the planet essentially tells them to leave by... Well, one of them steps on a rock and gets blown up. Another one gets hit by lightning and is incinerated. And that should be a sign to leave the planet. Hey, the planet's trying to kill us. Maybe we shouldn't be here. And then they meet all these villagers and it's like, Hey, your god is not a good god. We must change mm -hmm. your ways. Now, the Enterprise is in danger because we didn't leave when the first guy got blown up. And Spock was like, These people are healthy and they're happy. And they're thriving the way they want to. And McCoy is like, they're stagnant. If they want to be that way, let them be that way. They're not harming anybody, and they're not harming themselves. Also, you're running around on a ship that for some reason is still full only with white dudes. You're fairly stagnant, stagnant, my friend. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I did like Picard, though. And I kind of liked how they showed more of the universe, you know, other than just Starfleet. Oh, yeah. yeah. That was cool. You know, like, Starfleet's kind of like the ideal thing, but then it's like, wait, the rest of the universe, in some cases, is kind of fucked. Got the Fenris <laughs> Rangers! Well, and, yeah. and there's also, we see what happens to idealism in certain cases. Oh, yeah. Like, Picard's break off from the Federation. Basically, the moment they decided yeah. it was too hot for them to handle and they had to get out. Something that Picard took very personally. Almost problematically personally. Like That's like the subplot of that series is Picard wanting to save the day and trying to make up for the whole Romulan thing. When like, you know, that happened. I think the greatest meme to come out of Picard was uh, Fleet Admiral What's-Her-Name, the CNC of Starfleet, saying, The sheer fucking hubris. Because now that is a meme on, on Facebook for when people are idiots. And it is mwah, chef's kiss. <laughs> I love Picard, it. Yeah. I mean, yeah, Picard gets a lot of hubris. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Which, you and know. And someone said it to his was, face. He was Admiral Picard. He, he had backing to have hubris. Which does mean that eventually when you step over that line you just have so much more hubris to blow up including when you decide that you're going to go into an area marked for romulans only in a planet where people are very disappointed with you and start talking at romulan at them though that scene has one of my favorite lines because one of the other great lines to come out of that show was i regret your choice yes <laughs> It was such a good punchy line when it comes up. It is. It is. I regret your choice. I wish they, you know, told us what happened. They left too many loose threads for my liking, and I hope they pick them up in season two. Mm -hmm. uh, there's going to be a season two? There's supposed to be a season two. Ooh. Well, then they're supposed to leave loose threads. Well, otherwise, what do you do with a season two? Make new threads. Yes, but yet... Yeah, yeah. For it to be a series and carry over, you always have to have some of the loose ones. This is how you do anything that's got a sequel. 
Yeah, but they never said what happened to uh, the Romulan brother. No. Is he still on the planet? Is he holed up on the La Serena? Here's the thing. Yeah. I don't think that's an important thread. No, but it's leaving me, <laughs> yeah. making me wonder. Like, oh, it's not literally every single thread of anything. And honestly, of the questions that exist, I don't really care about the Romulan brother. Like, I mean, yes, he has he has enough of a character arc that he's not despicable entirely, but, like, I still don't care about him. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I don't really care about him either, but, you know, he's still got potential to be a problem or not a problem in the future. Oh, that reminds me. Yeah, like... I found out why Bruce Maddox had a different actor for Picard. The guy who played him in Next Generation retired from acting, and apparently didn't feel that he was up to acting again and that's why they had to get a different actor for him that's not that surprising yeah partially because like a lot of what you see in picard is these people who we made a show about them in their prime are now kind of past that and how are they coping with that which in some cases such as with Riker and counselor troy i troy i literally could not remember her name they were doing great Picard, uh, at loose ends. Yeah, well, I think Picard has never been a perfect character. No. And it's kind of interesting to explore that some. Like, if he was just doing all right, then that wouldn't be as interesting to put him at the center of a show, you know? So that's why it's not about Riker, it's about Picard. Yeah. <laughs> because, kind of in a hubris way, like, Almost at the, like, you know, with Picard, it was he left Starfleet because of the decision to do with the Romulans, and he has never been able to deal with that because it was the wrong thing to do. And Picard does not do the wrong thing to do, and the Federation does not stand for the wrong thing to do. I he also doesn't handle failure well. It. No. Mm -hmm. But he didn't think, like, it was kind of a bluff. He didn't think they'd take him up on it, and then they did. And he's like, well, fuck me. What do I do now? <laughs> yeah. Because, you know, realistically, like, he left the Federation. And, you know, he's right. It was a shitty thing for them to abandon these people that they had said they were going to help, you know. Mm -hmm. But he's not in a position to do anything to help anyone when he doesn't have the backing of the Federation. Yeah. So... He left, and then there was nothing he could do about anything. Well, he didn't I even, you know, visit, it, um... Yeah. Oh, come space on. Elf. No, he um, the Space Elf. It's fine. Well, him, too, but I'm thinking of, um, human... Rafi? Lieutenant Commander... Rafi, yes. Ah. He didn't finish up yeah. Rafi until he needed something from her? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, he didn't show up until he needed something. He didn't show up to visit uh, Alrond or whatever his name was. Yeah, um, the cute Romulan. It starts with an E, I think, but yeah, the, the kid, he didn't... Elnor. Elnor, that's it, yes, yeah. okay. He didn't go to fight him ever, okay. you know, he yeah. just kind of sat in his house being yeah. feeling sorry for himself. Well, going back to Justin's point of not dealing well with failure, I think he deals better with failure than he does with not trying, even in the face of failure. I think Picard would rather do the right thing and potentially lose everything because of it than take a sl safer path and in some way fail someone with that. Mm -hmm. I, yeah. I feel like he cares more about moral failure than like, I tried and it didn't work. And he's had a lot of time to just reflect on Yes, it wasn't a safe thing to do. Yes, there was danger involved. But I should have found a way to do it anyway. Which I think might have been part of the show too, is, is him still wanting to be Captain Picard, Admiral Picard, and trying to figure out how to do the right thing without being a Starfleet officer. How could I still be Picard when I'm not a Starfleet officer? You know, it occurs oh. to me... They never did follow up with what happened to the Atlantis project on Picard. Uh, so Picard Vineyard, when his brother and nephew and sister-in-law were still alive, uh, back on the TNG episode Brothers. So he went, visited the Picard Vineyard, and I believe it was Maurice came and visited. 
and was talking about raising up the seafloor in the Atlantic Ocean to make a new continent, which is actually a really dumb idea uh, for reasons yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'll not get into right now. And Picard was like, floor. I've got some ideas. Uh, maybe I'll share them with you. Because he was just kind of grasping at straws, trying to put his life back together after dealing with being a Borg. They never did follow up with that. And, you know, they could have had a line about that somewhere in Picard. Somebody, like, kind of threw it at him as a Jap. And he's like, okay, it went badly. Yeah. Let's not talk about it. Yeah. We don't talk about the Atlantis Project because it was a stupid-ass idea. It was a stupid-ass idea. Let's no. not Wait, raise now the C4. No. Nobody wants that. No. Especially not... I mean, you've got other planets. Back... Was it before or during... I think it was before World War II. There was a scientist in Germany who wanted to uh, create a new continent by putting a dam over by the Suez Canal and just turning you, that entire you, area into a new landmass. Where does he expect the water to go? I don't know. Because that's the immediate problem, is a dam isn't like an infinite holder of water. Yeah. You can, you can use dams to shape where water is and isn't, but you still have the same amount of water that has to go someplace. Also, the land that was going to be created was going, would have been super salty and you couldn't grow anything on it. Yeah, there'd be that too. Yeah, also, it just like, would have caused more problems ocean, than it would have solved. The ocean's really deep. It is. Even seas are very deep. Yeah. I mean, did my dude think of trying this on a lake first and realize how bad of a plan it was? I imagine not. I'm going to have to find that link on that I saw, and uh, I'll put that in the show notes as well. When did you say this was? Uh, this was before World War II, I believe. He had the idea for. Was this something that like got thrown out when they were talking about the fact that they did not have enough German land to feed German people? I think so. so. Was, yeah, that sounds right. Because because that was the whole like plan with Hitler. Like it was it was you know, we need to be able to grow more food, so we will take land from other people. Like it was a, it was theoretically a lot of the motivation going into World War II for Germany. Yeah. Bad plan. Very bad plan. Mm. Yeah. I want to link you know. back to a thing just instead of talking about the Romulan brother. I think I started this a little bit, but Here's the thing. I think there was enough character development slash him now knowing that synths are not actually dangerous in theory, that he's not going to become a problem. He's like he even seemed to like he got along okay with the crew when they were forced to work together. A bit mm -hmm. where like he's throwing rocks at their ship and they're like, Who the hell is that? And he's like, I've got explosives, but I'm throwing rocks. How about we talk? Yeah, <laughs> He's a I did like that scene. Sensible yeah. person, and so I don't think he'd become a problem for them in the future. But mm -hmm. you know, he did try yeah. and kill, you know, the synth girl, which means that he is he is should never go anywhere near her and her crew. Which, like, they were they, at the end of the show, they had set them up as a crew. Yes, they did. So, like. Mm -hmm. From a positive interaction standpoint, he kind of burnt that bridge way too much to be able to even come by and say hello. Yeah. Um, so I don't feel like he has much of a part to play in the future of that show. Yeah. Like, um, well, as far as him becoming a problem, though, I mean, I know he, he had character development, but it's also really easy to fall into old habits, you yes. know? Character so it's development. Like, I think character development is even a stronger word than was there. He had a cause, and yeah. he was going for that cause. And then he found out that that cause was not what they thought it was. He didn't even have to change as a character, really. Like, mm -hmm. he didn't try and... What is her name? I cannot remember. The synth the girl, name. or... The synth girl. Uh, the one who is... Dr. Dr. Fairly... No, that's Agnes. Hold on. I want to say it started with the letter S. She's a fairly important character whose name I have completely forgotten. Uh, I remember Picard's name. <laughs> I, I do know Picard's name. Uh, I remember that Raffi's name. 
I remember Agnes Gerardi and Captain yeah. Rios. Captain Rios, that's it. Yeah, Crystal we need we Rios. need more Captain Rios. And his holograms. And all and of his, his holograms. holograms. Yes. Oh, his holograms are great. What is your mental o oh my god? <laughs> <laughs> But also Raffi just sitting down with all of the holograms as they try and figure out what's wrong with the captain. That mm -hmm. that was my favorite scene in the entire series. That was a good scene. Um, but the synth girl, uh, he genuinely cared about her. He was genuinely boy, upset yeah. to kill her, but he genuinely knew he was saving the universe and doing it. And he did not... Because the, the other way this can go is when, when the reality unfolds that the thing you're fighting for has been a lie, like that can crack you open. And it didn't feel like it did that for him. So he doesn't even have, like, like I said, when he needed to work with the crew, he, you know, wasn't a terrible person to deal with. He's clever, no. he's manipulative, but his motivation to be an antagonist has left. And I don't... Uh, the motivate, yeah. I mean, he feels like an opportunist to me, though, which can sometimes turn one way or the other. You know, yeah. like I think he's gonna be like looking out for himself first. Yeah, which Probably can usually. put him at odds. You know, I mean, he was around a bit, I guess. You know, it's just I hope they actually just at least say where he went. I did not like that they uh, put. Rios and Gerardi in a relationship. Yeah, the, uh... I feel like that's kind of another point where it's like that bridge should have been pretty well burned and somehow was not. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, so I don't know. What? That was a little bit weird. I did like the thing with uh, Rafi and Seven, though. I liked Seven. And I liked Seven's character. I liked her yeah. character in this. Like, you could kind of see how. Huh? I said seven was great. Seven, was yeah, really good. yeah. I also like, and I could be remembering this wrong, but it definitely looked like it looked like seven, and um, I, I'm just gonna call him a space elf because that is what the actor said in the after. Because <laughs> when we were watching, we were watching this. We were watching them with oh, whatever show it was that Will Wheaton does after, after credits track. or something. Uh, yeah, and he was chatting with them. And, and, and that actor described that character. He's like, yeah, I'm basically a space elf. Which well, that's because he is basically is what a space Falcon elf. what or a Romulan is. They're space elves. Yeah. Um, but it looked like he and Seven were going to hang out and have fun adventures, and that looked cool. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think that it's probably a better fit for that character than following Picard around. Yeah. Yeah. But or more of a, you know, apprenticeship weird. and not romance. Like, you can have male and female characters be like, it exists in space with each other without a romantic relationship having to form. Mm -hmm. Promise. You can do it. Yeah. You well, in that last episode, two of her and Rafi were holding hands and stuff, so I thought that they were going that direction. Okay. Uh, so, scratch what I say. That I, I want to emphasize a male and female, I have a lot more problems if they're just pushed into a weird romantic relationship mm -hmm. because they happen to be in the same space. The moment mm -hmm. you make it a queer romantic relationship, I'm all aboard. Yep. <laughs> like, there was a hint of it when they went to Free Cloud. When I rewatched it for the third time, uh, when Rafi was talking to Seven, I was like, oh, maybe they try to be subtle here and they were too subtle. But maybe this is where we get a hint. But then again, maybe I'm imagining it. For, um, For Rafi and Seven. Rafi and Seven. Yeah. yeah, but in the um, final episode when they're sitting at the table, though, they were, like, holding hands. Yeah, they're holding hands and playing uh, Calto and drinking mm -hmm. whatever they're drinking. Yeah. Hopefully tea. Oh, yeah, Rafi. Please let it be tea. Yes, Rafi. <laughs> Addiction yep. is serious business jump to an entirely different franchise have you two seen she-ra and princesses of power not yet not oh. yet no it's great also very subtly until the end pretty gay i've heard that it's gay and i've heard that it's great yes yeah it's on it's on my list right now i'm working my way through this 
third season of Black Lightning. I don't even know what that is. It's a superhero show. Ah. But it's mostly people of color uh, characters, and one of the main characters is in a relationship with another woman and stuff, so so that's nice. Yay! I'm currently oh, watching yeah. Legend of Korra, currently in <laughs> book one, chapter... I think we're starting chapter three tonight. And okay. the Dragon Prince, we're in book three, oh. chapter four question mark i would have to look at what netflix says the great thing about dragon prince is that there are with the adults there are queer relationships deaf representation nice yes one of the generals is deaf straight up deaf and Mm -hmm. uses sign language and i Mm -hmm. can't read signs i don't know which one it is or if it's one made up for the show but it's definitely sign and The show is great, and I strongly suggest that people watch it. I do not like yeah. hyping shows, but I believe that it is fantastic. Let mm-hmm. me hype a webcomic to you real fast. Okie dokie. Real, real fast. So, talking about deaf representation, this isn't actually the webcomic. This is the second book in the series. But there is a webcomic called Pea Dragon Society, and it is a adorable and cute it has queer relationships and if you go and you buy the second because it she went and she made the webcomic into a book follow-up book in this webcomic where they have sign and in fact like in the beginning she's got like a little guide almost that's like i i happen to have this book sitting next to me yeah note to reader showing this is what it looks like when they're using sign and this is what it looks like when they're using sign and speaking because you know everyone in this village knows how to use sign because they've got a deaf person nice it's great it is adorable and it is a fast read it's a slice of lifestyle webcomic which i know isn't necessarily what everyone likes but it's a fast read it's adorable it's got queer characters in it it's completely wholesome all kinds of things if you could drop a link in the show notes channel, I'll yep. make certain to put it in the show notes. It was, it was, I think it was the, you saying deaf representation. And I was reminded of these beautiful books. Oh, they're so good. They're so sweet. It is refreshing to have positive deaf and queer representation in, in children's media, oh, in yeah. well-written children's media. Like, I am here for Dragon Prince and Steven Universe and Avatar and Legend of Korra, like, hardcore. Mm -hmm. I have never heard of Dragon Prince, but apparently might need to watch it. I'm so bad at watching things, guys. Yeah, it's the uh, same creators as uh, Avatar. I didn't hear of it until this year. It's three seasons, nine episodes each season. Fast watch. And short, short episodes. It's like a half hour show. Um, I think I heard of it, like, I think I started watching it when the first season, there was only one season. Oh, and there's people Out. of color. Question. Answer. Polly? In, hmm. In really any of these other than, I know in Steven Universe, because I'm going to be real with you. Yeah, Steven uh, Universe. I did have an episode of Steven Universe after which me and a girlfriend held each other and just very excitedly said, polyfusion 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 for several minutes yeah i remember that episode (laughs) that's a representation i would like there to be more of Mm -hmm. let me just go through my mental notes right quick i don't believe so yeah i can't think of anything right offhand avenue five does oddly enough what's that yeah uh that is a science fiction comedy it has um (sighs) dr house got hugh laurie thank you in it Hugh Laurie. Yeah. It is a science fiction show, comedy. One episode yep. is super dark. Oh, God. I did not need to see yeah, that. Yeah, the second to the last one was, like, super dark. I'm like, whoa. It's like the whole thing was dark, but it's like, this is too much. Um, Essentially, you're but, people are on a cruise line in space, and it's supposed to be how many weeks, and it turns into several months. Oh. Yeah, because they get knocked off course, and the ship's designed like stupid. So they're stuck out there, and they're kind of dealing with all those issues and stuff. But the captain, um, the Hugh Laurie character, has a husband and a wife. Nice. Um, back at home, 
and they're dealing with typical relationship drama. You know, I didn't expect yeah, you to like be Yeah, like you're gone stuck so in space. Long, yeah. And, you know, That's we were having thing. this issue before you left for your captaining gig. and Like, I both really want to write polyamorous characters, but then I'm also kind of nervous about it because if I did and I got any kind of publication, suddenly that's conversations I have to have with people. Totally understandable. Mm-hmm. Which the difference between poly rap and talking on a small podcast and when you're talking about poly versus queer, when you are talking about poly, you come up for yourself and your at least most known partner, or at least the partner that the people you're talking to are coming out with. Like, if I come out as bisexual, this doesn't out anyone who's in a relationship with me of anything mm-hmm. other than being willing to date a bisexual. But if I were to yep. tell somebody that I'm poly, well, then that you, you can't just say I'm poly, but hey, don't worry, the person I'm married to is monogamous. It's all fine. Yeah, that does open up some doors for conversation that it's not easy to have opened, especially in this day and age. Mm-hmm. And part of the world. Yeah. And not always yes. safe either. Oh, exactly. Yes. Yeah. Because there's, you know, on the one hand, I don't necessarily want to alienate like people and then there's on the other hand uh there you know it's not a protected group so if a workplace decided to have a problem with it in mm-hmm. minnesota as a no oh, what's that called no fault no or fault. no not no fault but at will oh at yeah will. at will no faults for yeah. driving yeah. yeah yeah which is what i started to say and what we all immediately thought of but yes it's it's the equivalent of that but for a job at will I do worry about that sometimes because I have been somewhat vocal about being polyamorous. You know, I write about it on my website. My coworkers, mm-hmm. if they decided to poke around, could find my site where it has a picture of me on it and uses various pronouns for myself and talks about being polyamorous and has recordings of myself being on panels about polyamory. That could go poorly if a workplace decided to, uh, you know, retaliate against me. And it's getting worse instead of better. And it's like it didn't get that great to begin with, but now we're going backwards. Yes, we are. And it's, I don't know, it's just frustrating. It's like, as human beings, we should have been doing better than this, like a lot better a long time ago. And not only are we not doing that, but we're also reversing progress being yeah. dragged yeah. backwards kicking and screaming science has been politicized basic yep. health has been politicized yeah mm-hmm. there's a fucking pandemic going on should we listen to the cdc only if we're pushover liberals yeah well i'm gonna get a t-shirt that says pushover liberal nice <laughs> Have either of you been getting um, political scare mail from the Republican Party? No, I have not. Oh. No, I've oh, seen man. advertisements online, though. Wait, I've seen pictures from friends who have, but I haven't. Yeah. So, like, Joe Biden has been, has embraced the radical left, which I always look at, and I'm like, Republican Party, stop trying to break my heart by thinking Joe, Li- Joe, Joe Liberal. Stop trying to break my heart by making me think Joe Biden is a radical left. Yeah. Yeah, I saw something about that on Twitter earlier. They're like, um, yeah, you really think this is radical left? It's like, I've got some unfortunate facts for you. <laughs> yeah, it's barely even center left. I mean, mm-hmm. One of the three things listed on there is talking about the Green New Deal which is probably the truest quote from Biden that they have on the flyers, which is essentially like moving away from fossil fuels, which they say is as like getting rid of blue collar jobs. That's like, Mm -hmm. really? You're still on the point of trying to pretend that coal jobs are a net positive. They're not even good jobs to have. Like they're good in the sense that they're like skilled labor that is worth a lot. And Mm -hmm. which makes it so that, and you know, sometimes they 
their existence props up the entire economy of a small town. But there are mm-hmm. ways of dealing with that in ways that don't hurt those people that don't involve killing the entire planet. Plus so you can have money. Like, we're at the point where global warming is starting to really impact everybody's life. And you're at a point where I'm like, is that money worth it right now? Is the, the mm-hmm. money you're making balancing out, like, even being selfish, your own day-to-day life? Like, plus, everybody's affected by climate change at this point. Plus mm-hmm. something that a lot of them keep forgetting about or purposely not bringing up is that the economy is what's been killing coal jobs, not, you know, I mean, green politics. Because yeah, I think- consumers have been wanting different materials and That's not so one hundred percent true. It's not one hundred percent true, but it's more true than th- what you know the uh, right wing clean energy shouty has, people have been saying. Clean energy has gotten a major boost from legislation. Like now, it's competing with it, and it doesn't necessarily need legislation to hold it up. But it has helped the fact that it's gotten some push and there's been rules talking about you have to, you know, forcing cars to be more sustainable. Oh, yeah, it's definitely helped. Yeah, I'm just it, talking about it, coal specifically, though. Like, uh, oil now, is still, you know. Yeah. Nowadays, where we are now, yes, economic forces are enough to prop up a lot of renewable energy. But well, I mean, like most industries, it got there with the help of the government. And which, PSAs. Which also, as as I just kind of hinted at, isn't unique to clean energy. No. It's one of the reasons why a lot of plastics, though they say they're recyclable, don't get recycled. Okay, here's the other thing. Here's the big problem with that. When you look at your plastic container... And it's got that little rectangle on the back with a number. That is not a recycling symbol. That does not mean it is recyclable. That tells you what type of plastic it is. Correct. And a lot of people think that's a recyclable symbol. I will see people be like, oh yeah, I can see this one's recyclable. And they throw it in the recycling. Okay. I care about recycling. I work at a co-op. So like, this is entirely in my wheelhouse. If you are recycling something, it must be clean and it should be dry. If it is a recyclable product, but you still have foodstuffs in it, that is trash or you clean it. Because if that goes into the recycling plant, that can contaminate all of the other recycling that it's in the load with. So make sure it is actually recyclable, which is gonna depend on your specific recycling like thing. You can check that usually on their website and make sure it's clean and dry and don't wish cycle also in the city of minneapolis and several other places you're no longer allowed to recycle black plastic so know the rules i didn't know you could recycle black plastic in the first place i thought that was never recyclable nope that is so that's going to depend on what the plastic is actually to kind of clear up what these terms mean technically by a technical definition you don't recycle plastic. Recycling is when you say take a glass bottle, melt mm-hmm. it down, and then turn it into any other thing because you've made it into glass. Yes. Plastic doesn't work like that. Like if you have water bottles, plastic water bottles, and you melt them all down, that's not just like new material that is going to become instantly the same kind of water bottle. You, you're actually reusing it that's why, actually, if you've ever seen any of those reusable bags that say on them, like, I used to be plastic bottles or something like that. It's because you have to, you're, you're just taking it and you're using it for something new. Because that's how plastic works. Now, because of this, recycling plastic isn't as, like, in general, from a material standpoint, as good or as useful as recycling glass or aluminum. You, you have to find something else you're going to make it into. And right now, pl- um, oil, I think oil is pretty cheap right now, which means that making new plastic is generally cheaper and easier to do than recycling plastic. Very much now, so. 
the reason that a while ago in Minneapolis or Hennepin County, I think it actually is, where they sent out to Hennepin County and said, we're not going to take black recycling anymore. The reason for that is because they sort plastic recycling with lasers. They throw a laser on it, it bounces back, tells them what kind of plastic it is, and allows it to be automatically sorted. Black plastic will not reflect a laser, so it has to be sorted by hand, which is more labor con consuming and therefore costs more, and plastic barely pays for itself in a, in a recycling plant as it is, so they don't want to put extra resources onto black plastic because that's just like one extra step and an extra cost for something that's not worth a lot. And that is why in Hennepin County, they do not want your black plastic recycling because they have to sort it by hand, not with lasers, and it's just not valuable enough to be worth their time. You know what I that miss? My soapbox. What do you miss? I miss when you had to separate your paper, aluminum, and plastic. You know, before it co-mingled. Why? Because the recycling plants didn't have to... Uh, it was easier to have all that sorted out and not as much of that got pulped uh, and put into landfills when it made it to the plant of the recycling. Because we had to be more conscious about what we were recycling. Yeah, but also a lot more got thrown... Like, yes, the recycling plant itself had to throw out less but we were throwing out a lot more in a very general term. But is the amount of what's being thrown out from commingling offsetting what was not being thrown out? So I can't know that for sure. I do know that they did put the time, money, and resources into going for the commingling. Mm -hmm. So I'm guessing in, in some capacity, and it could just be like a placebo thing like it could just be people feeling better about doing more recycling but it was worth the resources to put into a change for the recycling plant itself or at least for the county the county um you know some people recycle terribly here's the thing when we were you know sorting them out separately are were people more likely to rinse and get their recycling perfect just because they had to put it in a specific bag. Well, I can't speak for others. I can only speak for myself. Yeah, yeah. and that's the thing. Um, Co-mingling allowed the bar to be put lower. And depending on what your household uses, like if you're a household that mostly uses aluminum cans and glass jars and whatever, then chances are co-mingle works just fine and isn't going to put it out. It's when you're using a lot of plastic that it can get really mixy like never put plastic bags in with plastic recycling unless it is specifically allowed because that will gum up the works at the recycling plant like it's dangerous don't do it yep most of most of the problem rules are with plastic and the problem is plastic is not a good recyclable material but it also is a very, it's it's worse to have plastic in landfills than to try and find something to do with it. But it's just not a very reusable material. I think it's not designed to be. I think it's not designed to break down. That's like part of why it's great for the things we use it for. One of the things I like about the Orville is that all of their drink containers are metal. They don't use plastic for anything. It's like you got the, the, the beer bottles and your water bottles and your drink containers, all metal. It's like, yeah, that's the kind of future I want where everything is recyclable. There is. And this actually comes in when we're talking about buying uh, drinks that are in glass versus plastic bottles. There is a certain cost to using glass in the fact that it is much heavier and therefore it takes more fuel to move it. You're also more likely to break it, so it's less likely to do its job successfully. Like, as much of a problem as plastic is, it's still also a really good material to use for many reasons. It's just not a material we have a good way of disposing of. 
so once again, like I, I stated it earlier, I work in a co-op, so I get to see a lot of this, but then I'm also a very analytical person who likes to dig in deep. And so I see the, oh, everybody wants their containers to be glass, and then also research into that enough to look at and say, what glass is much less environmentally friendly to move. Metal is a bit better when you're using aluminum, especially, uh, because it's a very durable material and it's lighter. Honestly, my only problem with aluminum is, is if for a water bottle is I don't like the way the water tastes in an aluminum water bottle, but it's honestly a better, it's, I feel like it's not as romanticized from a um, environmentalist perspective as much as glass is, but it's probably a better material. Yeah. No, I agree with that, yeah. It doesn't break. It's lighter. It's very easy to recycle. Well, hopefully we will get there where we use less plastic and have better recycling across the board. But we've been recording for over an hour now. And I'm not really sure if there was a theme. Ah, uh, themes are overrated. <laughs> You're the one who's got to stitch it all together. That is so, true. That is luck. true. Please keep in my soapboxes about the importance of how to recycle properly. Oh, definitely. Any last thoughts, anyone? Everyone remember, always feed your space elf. <laughs> I'm sure he can feed himself. <laughs> he can just also go visit. up to somebody and, and ask. It's like, hey, can, can I have that burger? And they can be like, no, I regret your decision. <laughs> Stab. <laughs> That's that's a joke. I don't think he would ever kill a person for not giving him a food. He would just look sad. Yeah. Yeah, probably. he would just like yeah, use the puppy dog eyes and they'd be like, Fine, here's the burger. <laughs> no, no, actually he would just state very directly how disappointed he was about it and how much he wanted the burger. Yeah, probably. Just just do the complete Oh, but I'm hungry. See it looks like he had that line like, Oh, isn't it just as well that, that they die because they're in so much pain? Do you want me to die? Well, that would make me sad. <laughs> well, on that note, have a great night, everyone, and we'll catch you next time. It's nice to be here. Good night. Good night. <laughs>